Hey guys, Melissa here, and this is the book break. Today, I've got some cool guys here with me. Now, do you like to read books? Oh yeah. Okay, how about you? Yes. yes? Let's go talk to some authors. Come on. Brandon Mole, guys, I'm excited. Thank you so much for being with me, Brandon. Sure, this is great. Okay, so tell me, you started back in 2006? Yes. With Fable Haven. Yes. Tell me your process with that because everyone wants to know where you came from. Okay, so as a kid, I was a huge daydreamer. I always liked to make up stories. My wildest fantasy was that I could write books and share them with people. Um, it took a lot of years of practicing before I even got close to that. I was age 30 in 2006 when, when that came out. And so um, it had been through my teenage years, through high school, through college, trying to learn how to write a good scene. Eventually, um, I, 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 I finally was able to write something that people got excited about at age 30, which is Fable Haven Book One. Hence, that's my first published book. And you published with, that book was with Shadow Mountain, right? That's right, yeah. And how did you get in with Shadow Mountain? Because it's it's somewhat difficult to get a publisher these days. It's super hard to get a publisher. Um, I, I, had, I had been working in marketing at a place called Excel Entertainment that did independent films. And I, through a contact, through a friend, they said, Shadow Mountain is starting to do mainstream fantasy. Um, I had shopped my material to different publishers. I'd never thought about a Utah publisher. I didn't know there was Utah publishers doing fantasy. Yeah. Um, so when I heard about it, I submitted um, and I had the good fortune of connecting with an editor named Chris Schobinger who really liked how I wrote. Um, the book I submitted wasn't Fable Haven. It was called The Other End of the Hippo at the time, which is what <laughs> became the Beyonders series. Yes. Um, and he liked high rope, but he didn't, he didn't feel like that was exactly what he was looking for, for Shadow Mountain. And so I told him the premise of Fable Haven. He liked the premise over the next five months while also working full time. I, I wrote Fable Haven. And when I showed him, he liked it. So Fable Haven got published the first place it was sent, which was Shadow Mountain. Um, but that was after I failed for so long with so many short stories <laughs> and a different novel. That is so awesome. Okay, so I didn't know that. You started at Excel Entertainment. A little known fact for our viewers, I used to work for Excel Entertainment. Oh, did you really? In marketing. So oh, that's really funny. So we must barely missed each other. That yep. is so funny. I was probably a little before you is what I would imagine. I was there 2000s. So we oh. Were we were probably right around the same time. Oh, no, yeah, it was similar, yeah. I didn't realize it was that long ago for <laughs> okay, you. Okay, guys, yeah. so what the, the moral is, we're BFFs, we were just pretending here. Now you know, BFFs yes. with Brandon Wall. So Fable Haven was your first big thing. Yes. And what what did you do with the Beyonders? Because I've read the Beyonders. If you guys haven't, you need to. Uh, how did you eventually make it to the Beyonders? Tell me a little bit more about your process with your Fable Haven series and then the Beyonders. Okay, well, with Fable, Haven, I had an idea for a five book series and didn't know if I'd get to execute it because the publisher only bought a, a single book because I was an untested author. Um, and so then when it was successful, I was able to expand that out in, into five books. And probably the luckiest thing I've had as a writer is that Fable Haven kind of caught on. Like um, Simon and Schuster came in and did the paperbacks um, after the, the story got rolling. and. Uh, and Shadow Mountain did all the hardcovers. And I basically had two publishers who believed in it and a big readership that liked it. And um, it, it became a, a big enough brand that I was able to become a full-time writer, which was my lifelong dream. Um, I, I've actually returned to the Fable Haven books recently by writing Dragon Watch, which is a sequel series. Maybe we can touch on that in a minute. Let's do. Um, but Beyonders, I'd actually written before Fable Haven. Um, I'd written about a novel and a half of my Beyonder series, which is three books long. And I, I wasn't sure if I'd ever get to publish it. But after I finished Fable Haven, I looked back at those ideas and still thought they were good ideas. I just thought they needed a lot of reworking. And so I completely rewrote Beyonders, kind of using what I'd learned as I wrote Fable Haven. When I say I completely rewrote it, I mean new main characters. Like, like I, I rewrote every page of that book, like I, I, as if I was writing it fresh, right? Like, I wasn't like changing the old book, I was writing it all new. Um, and, uh, and, and that ended up debuting at number one on the New York Times list. So this book that I thought would never, um, that I worried would never 
um, Reach Readers ended up becoming a really successful trilogy and something I'm really proud of. It's a little bit more um, intense probably than Fable Haven. Yeah. It's heroes and broken heroes coming out of retirement. Um, it's got maybe a slower pace, a weirder start. Um, but I, I think it, of all my series, it's got one of the biggest, coolest finales of, of all my stuff I've done. Yeah, and I've got to say, if you haven't read The Beyonders, buy the first and the second book at the same time. Because if you start it and you get to the end, you're going to want to jump right in. I had to do that, and I'm so glad I did. It's true that Beyonders, more than most of the things I've written, is really one big, big, one big story broken into three. You know, Fable Haven is, each book is a pretty individual book that collectively form a series. But Beyonders is, is a lot more like one big story chopped up into three parts. So you don't really get the full weight of the finale till the end of three. Yeah. yeah. So let's go back to Fable Haven. And for those that haven't seen it, this is the original Fable Haven. You guys, seriously, you, you've got to check this out. So one thing I'm going to tell Brandon is when I was uh, having my second child, I was on bed rest and like stripped. I couldn't do anything. I Stayed alive because of Fable Haven. Oh, I am that's not great. kidding you. Like I couldn't take it slaying in bed all day, but I had Brandon Mole by my side, so it was okay. So okay, tell me about Dragon Watch. Dragon Watch is a direct sequel series to Fable Haven, which I never knew. Like, when I finished Fable Haven, I didn't know I was gonna do it. Um, I thought maybe that was the end of the adventures for those characters. When I wrote the end of book five back in 2010, I'd used up all my ideas. I, I thought I was done. Um, but looking back on the series, I, I thought about my, my favorite book in that series is Secrets of the Dragon Sanctuary, book four of Fable Haven. Um, I, I teeter between four or five. But what I liked about book four was that we went to a dragon sanctuary. Um, for those who don't know, the premise of Fable Haven is what if there were secret wildlife parks for magical creatures hidden among us? And there's different types of wildlife parks for different types of creatures. The dragon sanctuaries are the largest and most dangerous of these wildlife parks. And we only spent part of book four at a dragon sanctuary. And as I look back on the series, I was like, huh, there's it would be really fun to explore the dragon sanctuaries and let those larger, more dangerous parks be a bigger part of the story. And I came up with the idea of a new five book series called Dragon Watch, which emphasizes um, the dragon sanctuaries. So it's the same main characters as Fable Haven, a bunch of new adventures. So far, we're two books into the series. Um, my readers seem to really be liking it. And I'm excited for book three to come out soon, um, which is called Master of the Phantom Isle. And then there'll be two more books before that series is done. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here with me, Brandon. It's sure. been awesome. And thank you guys for joining us on the book break. We will see you next time. I wrote What the Single Eye Sees actually as individual talks or sermons that I gave in sacrament meeting. And every time I gave one of those talks, I had lots of people ask me for copies. It got to the point where I was sending out dozens of copies of the talks to people and I thought maybe I should organize them into a book so they'd have, be accessible by, some, by more people. The principal focus of the book, as, as it's stated in the subtitle, is faith, hope, charity, and the pursuit of discipleship. And so I hope people who read the book feel like they have a better understanding of the relationships that are, what are faith, hope, and charity. One of the key principles outlined in the fourth section of the Doctrine and Covenants for discipleship is to have your eyes single to the glory of God. That's a New Testament concept that Joseph Smith felt inspired to include in his discussion about the qualifications for being part of the work in this era. And so I use it as part of the title in order to emphasize the eye single to the glory of God. I hope you enjoy it. You can find it at barnesandnoble.com or amazon.com.